Yes, uh, hi everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, today we are going to uh, talk about fracture mechanics and the capabilities in ANSYS. Um, first, uh, a company overview. We are the ANSYS Elite Channel Partner in California and Nevada. We provide sales, marketing, training, and technical support, and also consulting services for the ANSYS software products. And those are structural, fluids, electronics, multiphysics, optics. And we also have a VR system that works with the ANSYS products. And we also have a Ozone Cloud cloud computing platform as well. Uh, we also collaborate uh, uh, with uh, uh, other offices on the East Coast with Mallet Technology and CATFAM in Michigan. So um, we also offer a fracture mechanics class. Um, uh, this uh, class is, uh, I believe it's a two-day class where we go through the history of fracture mechanics, uh, crack initiation, crack propagation. We go through, through the theory and then and then we also uh, talk about uh, how it's implemented in ANSYS. Um, there are workshops in there as well. Um, in case you're interested, you can sign up for that. These classes are offered in our Sunnyvale class. So, um, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Franklin has this famous saying, uh, but in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. We would like to uh, modify, uh, we'd like to propose a modification for this. In, but in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death, taxes, and fracture. So, um, and uh, according to a Battelle uh, uh, NBS study, fracture costs uh, about $120 billion a year. And this was, uh, in 1983 so that that's a lot of uh, money um, and that's uh, that's being um, you know due to fracture of parts due to fracture of components uh, uh, that's the cost of it to the economy so what is fracture mechanics it's the study of flows and cracks in the materials so here you know we are looking into uh, we are really studying uh, cracks and flows in the materials. It mostly deals with crack growth and life estimation. So uh, really straightforward. We are looking into how cracks propagate and how cracks form in parts. So why is fracture mechanics important? Uh, why do we talk about fracture mechanics? The reason being strength of material approach does not anticipate the presence of crack um, in the material. So uh, here on the left-hand side here, according to st strength of materials, the stress in a panel when you apply a force F and the cross-sectional area here is uh, A. So the stress in this panel is uh, sigma F divided by A. But if we put a small crack in that panel, then the stress goes up uh, drastically, right? right at the tip of the crack, it goes up drastically. So strength of materials cannot address the situation where we have a crack uh, in the material. So the presence of cracks can, can significantly decrease the structural strength and uh, reliability. So that, that is why you know, we need to, uh, 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 we, we have the science of fracture mechanics uh, because uh, uh, from strength of materials point of view, we cannot address uh, what is the stress at the crack tip? So flow size, crack size, uh, which is almost always denoted as A, small case uh, A, is, it's an important parameter in fracture mechanics. Why? Because the larger the crack size, uh, the different the stress intensity factor. Fracture toughness replaces strength of materials. In fracture mechanics, um, uh, uh, we talk about fracture toughness. And when we talk about linear elastic fracture mechanics, and that's denoted as LEFM, linear elastic fracture mechanics, LEFM, fracture toughness of a material is determined from stress intensity factor. And that's K sub 1C 
this is actually a material property. So K sub 1C is a material property, just like ultimate strength of a material. You know, in, um, in strength of materials, we talk about uh, yield stress, we talk about ultimate stress, and in fracture mechanics, we talk about K sub 1C. Both ultimate strength and yield uh, strength are material properties, so is K sub 1C. And if you have a lot of plasticity ahead of the crack tip, then we talk about J sub 1C because the J integral uh, handles uh, uh, the cases where we have a lot of plasticity ahead of the crack tip. And um, so if you would take a <coughs> panel with a certain crack size um, and then you try to cycle it, this is the type of curves you, that you would produce from uh, an experiment. On the left-hand side is what is the raw data. So on the vertical axis, you would plot crack length A, and on the horizontal axis, you would plot the number of cycles. Then uh, That's number of cycles. And as you see, as the number of cycles go up, the crack length is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's A. So the crack is going to get larger and larger. So this is the raw data you would get from an experiment. So you take this data, and you take uh, the slopes of this data at different points. From here, you generate the curve on the right-hand side. This is fatigue crack uh, propagation rate, dA over dN uh, on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, we talk about stress intensive factor range. So um, the point here where the red curve meets the horizontal axis this is called the threshold value. And the threshold value, it's an important one for fatigue uh, uh, crack propagation, because if delta K uh, is smaller than your threshold value, then the crack will not propagate. That's a very important point uh, in fracture mechanics, especially crack propagation. So, um, so again, if we take crack length and put it on the um, vertical axis, and then we put the um, number of cycles to failure on the horizontal axis, we see that the initiation stage, uh, there's an initiation stage over here, and uh, there is really no observable crack um, uh, at that point. And then at one point, there may be an observable crack and what, what does that mean? The crack may initiate from an already existing crack. There may be some crack in there. So this A0, A sub 0, always represents an initial crack size. Uh, so fracture mechanics always starts out with an initial crack size, A sub 0. That's also very important. Um, so what is before A0? Well, before A0, we can actually do a fatigue simulation. And in the fatigue simulation, um, if you look at uh, regular fatigue testing, fatigue tests are usually done to the point where there's an observable crack. And that observable crack, according to US Air Force standards, is um, uh, 10 thousandths of an inch. So as you're fatigue cycling a, um, a test specimen, when you start observing a crack size of uh, 10 thousandths of an inch, then you stop the fatigue test. So that brings us to this initiation stage. So before this stage is really fatigue uh, cycling uh, without a crack in it. So, um, so uh, the point I'm trying to make is, is uh, there may be, due to some manufacturing defects, you may start out with a a sub zero, there may be a, a, an already existing crack in the structure, or you may do some fatigue cycling that does initiate a crack or that creates an initial crack size. That's the initiation stage. So uh, then we look into stable propagation. And that's the second stage here. And the third stage is unstable uh, propagation. And where we do our simulations is really this 
a stable propagation state. So in uh, fracture mechanics uh, crack propagation studies, this is where we do these um, uh, 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 crack propagation simulations. Um, <clears throat> so crack initiation, again, the A sub zero. Physically, cracks initiate from an imperfection. Um, again, the, there may be uh, some type of imperfection in the material, so that, that can uh, start from there, or it may uh, initiate from an already existing crack, uh, or it may initiate from a damaged, locally weakened area. And as a stress analyst, as engineers that do this uh, stress analysis, we have to do a failure analysis. And what is the failure analysis? Well, um, you know, we have to do first a stress analysis and we have to come up with a failure criterion. And this is where ANSYS comes in, in this failure analysis. Um, so we have to do the stress analysis, determine the state of stresses, determine the uh, uh, strength of uh, uh, K sub one, uh, the stress intensity factor. And then once, uh, we determine what is the uh, uh, stress intensity factor and what is the state of stress, then uh, we do uh, we have to apply a failure criterion, uh, meaning that we, as a stress analyst, we need to determine uh, after we find out what the stress, uh, what the stress intensity factor is, we have to say, is this crack going to propagate or it's not going to propagate? And if it's going to propagate, which way is it going to propagate and how fast it's going to propagate? So this part is very important. This is where uh, ANS, us engineers using ANSYS, this is where we come in. We build uh, models um, and then uh, do the stress analysis in ANSYS. And then uh, once we have the results, then we, uh, uh, we make determination calls as to if the crack is going to propagate uh, or will it stay dormant? Um, and if it, does if it does propagate, which way is it going to propagate and how fast it's going to propagate? So um, uh, there's uh, uh, Griffith is known as to be the father of fracture mechanics. Uh, he, back in uh, 1920s, he did a bunch of experiments, and he found out that there's a relationship between the crack size and the stress that's applied. So he found out that just through experimental observation, he did, he was, he did not do any formulations, just through experimental observations, uh, he found out that stress times the square root of crack length, initial crack length, is a constant is a constant. This was a very important experimental finding. So later on, back in um, late 1950s, actually Williams developed the uh, cracked stress field. This was done 1959. So from 1920s to 1959, that's over a period of almost 40 years, there was no uh, mathematical development, but uh, the Williams solution found out the relationship between the stress and uh, the stress intensity factor, K sub one over here. And the square root relationship comes over in this form here. So this formulation was done uh, in 1959. And for in this formulation here, theta is the angle ahead of the crack tip. Uh, and when theta is set to zero, then all these formulas reduce down to this. K sub one is equal to sigma times two pi r. And uh, so um, this, uh, that is the, um, the stress intensity factor in mode one. K sub one refers to mode one, and K sub two refers to mode two, which is really a, a shearing mode. So what Griffith found out experimentally was verified by uh, Williams' solution. So, uh, 
So it is also important to distinguish the difference between K sub 1 and K sub 1c. Uh, K sub 1 uh, is what we get from the finite element solution. And as you will see from ANSYS, uh, ANSYS will output K sub 1 value, K sub 2 value, as well as K sub 3 value. Then, as um, you know, we uh, as engineers, we also have to research and find out what is the critical stress intensity factor, K sub 1c. And if the K sub 1 value is larger than the material property, which is stress intensity factor, critical stress intensity factor, then that means the crack is going to propagate. So in ANSYS fracture mechanics portfolio, if we divide up uh, this fracture mechanics portfolio into three pieces, uh, in the upper left-hand corner, we can talk about fracture parameter evaluation. So when we do a finite element model with a crack in the model, then we can determine the stress intensity factors, which is uh, our you know, primary objective, is to determine stress intensity factors. We can also determine the J integral value and like I said before, J integral is usually used in cases where there's a lot of plasticity going ahead of the crack tip. Stress intensity factors are almost always used as linear elastic uh, fracture mechanics, uh, which is uh, the case where you don't have too much plasticity. Kind of plasticity is kind of ignored ahead of the crack tip because uh, it's it, uh, it is like about 45 degree away from the crack tip, uh, but J integral is used for uh, elastic plastic cases. Then we have T stress, we have C star integral, we have uh, VCCT, we do, do have material force. So all of these are, can be output from ANSYS uh, when requested. Um, so those are what we call fracture parameter evaluations. And why do we say fracture parameter evaluation? Because then once we find what the stress intensity factor is, then we can evaluate, we can compare these values to critical stress intensity factors, which is a material property, and there we can determine if the crack will propagate or not. Then on the upper right-hand corner, we have crack growth tools. Uh, CZM method, VCCT method, XFAM method. We, will, we are going to look into these after this. And then fracture analysis enhances mechanical. Uh, you can do semi-elliptical crack modeling, arbitrary crack modeling, uh, uh, fracture parameter evaluation and visualization, debonding and delamination. Um, debonding is uh, slightly different than delamination. But uh, both of them can be addressed in ANSYS. And uh, also uh, in ANSYS composite prep post, uh, uh, fracture analysis can be done. And we also have access with fracture analysis, we have access to ACTs where you can develop your own criteria. Um, that ACT, uh, ANSYS customization toolkit, is really a very nice feature in ANSYS where you can really uh, write your own scripts, your own criteria for doing fracture, for doing and evaluating fracture mechanics parameters. So, so stress intensity factors uh, in ANSYS are output as K1, K sub 1, K sub 2, K sub 3 uh, for mode 1, mode 2, mode 3. And it characterizes the stress state near the crack tips and it's applicable for linear isotropic elasticity. <clears throat> the reason we made this table is because we wanted to show why do we have so many parameters that ANSYS outputs. And as you see here, stress intensity factors are applicable for linear isotropic elasticity. Whereas J integral is, um, uh, it, it can be done for isotropic plasticity, okay? And J integral, as the note says here, J integral is equal to the stress intensity factor if it's a truly linear elastic case. Um, so T stress, 
um, well, what is the stress? This is the stress acting parallel to the crack faces. And this is apl applicable in also in linear isotropic elasticity and plasticity. Then we have C star integral. Where do we use C star integral? We use it for steady state creep behavior. So you can associate C with creep behavior here. Uh, and uh, creep uh, actually happens a lot in uh, aluminum and titanium. So um, if you have uh, uh, crack growth in aluminum titanium, and if it's due to creep, you may want to look into C star integral. And then we have energy release rate, G, for VCCT. This is also uh, for linear isotropic, but it can also be also it can also be used for orthotropic and anisotropic elasticity. Please note, you know, um, J integral and stress intensity factors are for isotropic, but um, energy release rate G uh, is can be for orthotropic and anisotropic elasticity. And then uh, material force. This is for linear and nonlinear materials like hyperelasticity, plasticity. So this could be uh, really important um, in uh, uh, highly nonlinear materials. Highly nonlinear, well, what is a highly nonlinear? Hyperelasticity and uh, advanced plasticity, those are highly nonlinear materials. So if you do have, if you're concerned with crack growth in these uh, highly nonlinear materials, then from answers, we need to look at material force output. <clears throat> so uh, this is another table that shows the same thing. And the fracture uh, mechanics modes, mode one, mode two, mode three, uh, as you know, um, if you have um, a crack that is perpendicular to the applied load, then that's truly mode one. But if you have an incline crack like this, this picture here in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the page, then you have mode one as well as mode two. Because if you take the force, if you take this force and bring it down here on the crack faces, you will see that it has two components. One component that's per, uh, perpendicular, that's perpendicular to the crack face. The other one is that's parallel to the crack face, that means you have mode one as well as mode two for this crack here. So, um, so one important observation is when you talk about crack growth, crack growth usually takes place in mode one or very close to it. Meaning that if you if your crack is subject to, to is subject to mode one, mode two, and mode three all at the same time you may have an extremely complicated crack with complicated loads on this, then your crack may be subject to mode one, mode two, mode three, all at the same time. And when the crack starts uh, growing, meaning that as the crack starts running, what happens is uh, the crack adjusts itself such that the load is perpendicular to the crack face. So what does that mean? Uh, most of the time, this is not true for all the time, but most of the time, you will see that the crack realigns itself such that it's running in mode one only. That means the crack will start running in a, um, a different position. And just to prove that, let's look at a 2D edge crack propagation. We have this 2D edge crack plate analysis, and if we simulate the senses, this is exactly what we see. Uh, it, you will see that the crack over here, it starts as a slanted crack, and then uh, within a few cycles, it readjusts itself such that it is perpendicular to uh, the applied load. So it is most of the time, it's running in mode one. So that's the point we are trying to make when the crack um, you know, starts running. It really starts running in a uh, mode one situation. And here's another case where the crack aligns itself uh, such that it starts running in mode one. This is a relatively complicated case where you have different materials 
this is a material interface. You have one different material here, another different material where you see a lot of green. And then um, you have a, a tight load here. And the crack starts aligning itself such that locally uh, the forces are becoming perpendicular uh, to the crack faces. So, so uh, what are the crack modeling options uh, in ANSYS? We have uh, ANSYS basically can do an automatic semi-elliptical crack. Uh, in, it could be an arbitrary crack like we see here. Um, and this uh, semi-elliptical could also be semicircular, uh, and that's what we are looking at here. All we have to do is make sure that the, the two radii are aligned uh, just like itself. So if I bring up ANSYS here, what you do here is, uh, you know, you, you would insert a fracture uh, uh, over here, and that would be, you know, you would go to the model and you would say insert fracture, and that would insert a, an item here that's called fracture. And when you have a fracture folder, then you can insert an arbitrary crack, you can insert a semi-elliptical crack or a pre-mesh crack. And also you can do interface delamination or contact debonding. So uh, these two options here, interface delamination and contact debonding, uh, uh, they work really nicely with contact surfaces. Uh, if you have contacts, if you have an assembly where you have contacts in between, then they work really nicely over here. Then we have the smart crack growth that we will talk about. Uh, um, but uh, if you do insert, a, say, a semi-elliptical crack, which we did here, then what that's going to do is it's going to uh, create uh, like a submodel. Uh, and this is the submodel, and you can see the crack is inserted into the submodel here. And this is a semicircular crack in this case, and you can see the parameters. You, you basically specify the parameters of the crack in the lower left hand corner, where you specify the major radius, the minor radius, and as you know, if the major radius is equal to the minor radius, then that's a semicircular crack. And then you would specify largest contour radius. So um, what is the largest contour radius? It's the radius of this largest circle that you see over here. And then um, you would specify the element sizes and the mesh contours. So um, all of those can be uh, controlled from here. And ANSYS, what ANSYS does is it automatically uh, takes the, the, the current mesh and it, it uh, modifies the mesh such that it inserts this crack mesh in there. So uh, this procedure used to take weeks, um, days, uh, sometimes weeks in the past. But now it's very easy. Within like a couple minutes, you have a crack already embedded. And you can have multiple cracks. I can put multiple cracks here. And uh, we can look at the crack growth or multiple cracks as well. It's not only one. You can have multiple cracks. And we will talk about that as well. <clears throat> so what are the... Once you have a, a crack already embedded, then the question is, what are the crack growth rule tools? So for to determine the crack growth tools, we have XFEM, which stands for Extended Finite Element Method. We have CZM, Cohesive Zone Modeling. And uh, with the latest one is the Smart Crack Growth. So let's look at the XFEM method first. The extended finite element method is a good engineering approach to crack growth simulation, and it eliminates the necessity of remeshing cracked up regions. And if you look at this, um, uh, on the left-hand side is we are looking at a quasi-static crack propagation, and over here we are looking at fatigue crack propagation, where you know you have um, uh, you have primarily two cracks. Uh, in the model, and they are both uh, propagating. 
This is done using this expand method. And then a uh, cohesive zone can be used to simulate debonding or a crack growth along an interface. In this uh, model over here, oops, uh, we are looking at a picture of the uh, cohesive zone uh, based crack growth simulation. And this typical uses may be delamination of composite structures. In this case, we have a different material uh, that's peeling away from uh, the bottom material uh, over here. So if you would like to look into separation of adhesive joints, uh, then this may be CZM method, may be a good way to take a look at it. Um, and VCCT-based crack growth simulation, um, uh, this is uh, based on energy methods and uh, energy being, um, you know, it doesn't care about how much plasticity you have in these models here. It's going to look at the total energy. It may be elastic plus plastic energy. And from there, you can determine the crack growth over here. So, um, okay. So the, uh, the other one is the SMART crack growth. And SMART, that really stands for separating, morphing, and adaptive remeshing technology. So separating, morphing, and adaptive remeshing technology. So what this does is uh, that basically the SMART method, it updates the mesh from crack geometry changes due to crack growth. Uh, and as you see here, uh, you can see that the mesh ahead of the crack tip or crack front is, uh, is adjusted. Um, So, um, so crack growth, uh, the smart uh, crack growth method uh, is uh, uh, in, in 3D. It's mode one uh, dominant crack growth, and this is a this is an okay. Uh, this assumption is okay because, like you have seen, when we have uh, mode one, mode two, mode three, when the crack starts running, it always realigns itself such that it's running in mode one. Uh, the assumption here is that we are working with linear elastic isotropic materials, and behind the scenes, it uses ANSYS solid 187 elements uh, to do this uh, simulation. And it ignores large deflection and finite rotation effects, crack tip plasticity effects, and crack tip closure or compression effects. So these assumptions are important to note because you don't want to go and try to simulate a crack growth using SMART method if you have a lot of plasticity or, and or if you have a lot of large deflection and or if throughout the load cycle, if the, there is some opening and closing of the crack. And that, that may happen if you have uh, opening and closing. And uh, another assumption is the fracture criteria for static crack growth includes critical stress intensity factor and J integral. And fatigue crack growth is based on Paris law. What is Paris law? Uh, the simple equation is given here, dA over dN is equal to C times delta K to M power. So, um, and J integral can be defined as a path independent line integral that measures the strength of the singular stresses and strains near the crack tip. This is also very important. It's always a, uh, a path independent line integral, meaning that I can take a path like this, or I can take a much larger path or a smaller path. It should give me the same answer. So crack growth uh, is the separation process of two crack phases. Most general approach is the energy release rate method. A simple criterion based on energy release rate can be express, uh, expressed as when G, the energy release rate, reaches a critical value, G sub C, then we have crack growth. 
So G sub C is the critical fracture energy required to separate the two crack faces. And to calculate this, J integral or stress and density factors are typically used as a fracture criterion. So uh, there's a formula that, uh, you know, where G can, uh, it can be expressed in terms of either J integral or in terms of stress intensity factors, and here is the formula. So the energy release rate can be calculated from stress intensity factors uh, in this formula here, where, um, you know, uh, here K sub one refers to mode one, mode two, mode three, uh, the, these are the three modes, but when we talk about energy, energy is energy. It's a scalar. It doesn't matter which way it is. Uh, is it mode one, mode two, mode three? doesn't care. It's a scalar quantity, and you can calculate an energy. That, that's the nice thing about energy, working with energy, and that's one thing, you, you, you know, you will find out is that, uh, I mean, for those of you who are already in this, you know that uh, we talk about a, a lot about energy uh, in um, in fracture mechanics because uh, if we want to come up with a good criterion, we should really look into the amount of energy stored in the system. And then when that energy level reaches a critical level, everything, it will either, there will be either immediate fracture and the parts will split apart right away or there will be crack growth. So static crack growth, uh, for static crack growth simulation, SMART supports the J integral and stress intensity factor fracture criteria. Fatigue crack growth, uh, this is based on Paris law. So, um, and like we said, uh, what is uh, Paris law? Paris law is given here, dA over dN is a function of K and R. What is R? R is the stress ratio. Um, so in simple form, dA over dN is equal to C times delta K to the N. And, and here there are really two inputs, C and N. This is Paris law constants. And where do we input those? Uh, we input those over here under engineering data. Um, you would bring in a Paris law over here, and you would specify material constant C and material constant N over here. So these constants are experimentally uh, derived constants. So you can, uh, some of this is in published data, and for your material, you, uh, uh, or if you, in literature, you may find it, if you don't find it, then you may have to do tests to determine C and M. So, so um, okay, so that's where, you know, we would input that over here under Paris law, uh, we input the C and M. Um, and then um, initial crack uh, definition. So to do crack propagation, we have to, we input an initial crack in there, and that is what we are doing over here under uh, on the in workbench mechanical. We just insert a fracture, and in there we put an initial crack, semi-elliptical crack. Like we said, um, you know, uh, crack. We have to have an initial crack in there for the, this crack to propagate, if it will propagate. Once we have this initial crack, then we can start talking about the crack growth and how that crack grows. So we can, to have this initial crack, we can uh, bring in either a pre-mesh crack or we can bring in semi-elliptical or arbitrary crack. And then uh, we would insert the smart crack growth over here and uh, uh, and when you bring in smart crack growth in the lower left-hand corner, you will see the options for crack growth. The options for crack growth, uh, if you click on smart crack growth in the lower left-hand corner, you will see that, um, you know, it will say which initial crack are, do you want to work with? And there could be multiple cracks in here on the fracture folder. Uh, and in this case, you know, 
from the pull down menu, you can say, I want to work the one that's called semi elliptical crack. And you can rename these any which way you would like. So, and then crack growth option for uh, is it going to be static or for fatigue? Uh, and if it's going to be fatigue, then uh, we are going to, uh, this requires uh, the parasol functions, right? The parasol um, uh, constants need to be specified in the material. And then the crack growth methodology, it's either life cycle prediction or cycle by cycle. Uh, and then there are other things where you can say minimum increment of crack extension, maximum increment of crack extension. You can actually control uh, the minimum and the maximum increments. And then you can say, you know, you can actually stop this. Uh, if you click on stop at maximum crack extension, you can say when the, this crack here reaches a certain crack size, you can say stop the simulation. You can actually stop the simulation. So let's take a look at this case here. Um, we have uh, basically this model over here and the boundary conditions are we are applying pressure at the top surface and we are fixing it at the bottom surface and we have an initial crack. The initial crack is right over here where there's actually uh, a lot of uh, uh, tensile stresses uh, because as as this um, uh, as this uh, deforms as the structure deforms uh, over here as the structure deforms uh, let me show you an animation of how the structure deforms uh, basically, uh, as you're applying force or pressure at the top, you know, it's going to go up and down. Um, so that's going to be uh, uh, the, uh, the mode that uh, this will be, um, uh, this will be operating in, uh, kind of. So uh, as we are pushing down on this, it's going to go up and down. Um, and as it's doing that, then this portion over here is under tensile stresses. And as you see here, I, we put a crack in there and the crack does open up. And you can see, uh, given the parasol crack propagation, the crack is actually growing. This is an animation of the crack growth. And we can actually look at the coolant stresses as well, and we can have it animate the coolant uh, stresses. By the way, when you look at these plots, um, you see that uh, you know the coolant stresses usually determines the plasticity ahead of the crack tip, and um, usually um, you know uh, the plasticity usually happens away from the crack tip so that the head of the crack tip you, you're in linear elastic fracture mode over here. So um, you can ask for stress intensity factors. Uh, stress intensity factors are calculated here. Um, this is the stress intensity factor distribution going from left to right. And since this is a semicircular crack, uh, at the bottom here, at, uh, meaning along the crack front, um, as we go into the material, the stress intensity factor kind of uh, uh, reaches a, a lower value. It's high at the tips, which means when the crack starts growing, it will start growing at the tips first then it will start also moving into the material. But the stress intensity factor is higher at the tips over here. So, um, yeah, so this is where you would specify the, um, the crack growth uh, criterion. And then when you run the simulation, uh, 
you, when you run this simulation, it's going to run, it's going to take uh, steps. So in the output file, you're going to see load step one, and then it will say time is equal to 0 0.25. Uh, this, uh, this is pseudo time, meaning that uh, if the final time is one, this means 25% through this cycling, this is what you're going to see and uh, it's going to go and calculate the results. And then you, in the post processor, you can ask for stress intensity factors. You can ask to see J integral. You can ask to see VCCT results, which is uh, the energy results. Material force result, T stress, C star integral, equivalent uh, stress intensity factor range. And you can also probe what are the things that we can probe? Total number of cycles. Under this condition, for example, uh, if you click on total number of cycles to probe, it says over here in the lower left hand, in the lower right hand corner, it says um, uh, the number of cycles is 416 over here. So, um, and then at 20% through the load, it was at 93, and then 174, 255, and then it goes to 416. And then this column here, it says, did you change the mesh? And the answer is yes. So it was remeshing as it's uh, uh, taking, uh, you know, as it's loading it up, it's taking steps uh, to, uh, uh, as it's taking steps, it's also changing the mesh. It's remeshing as we go along this uh, solution range. So, and then we have a crack pro a crack extension probe. Uh, it says, okay, this is how much the crack grew. It basically grew in this case uh, eleven thousandths of an inch. That's the that's how much it grew. 11 thousandths of an inch. And uh, also stress intensity factors, you know, these are the stress intensity factors in mode one. In mode two, please note, this is in a tensile zone, so the mode one values are a lot higher than mode two values or mode three values. So there's not much uh, mode two or mode three going on. This is primarily mode one because uh, you can see it from the results. The results are this uh, mode one stress intensity factors are two orders magnitude larger than mode two or mode three. So uh, as you know, this year we have a new version of ANSYS. This is 2019 R1. Uh, there, there's been uh, new enhancements in smart crack growth. Now, uh, the smart crack growth also supports temperature loads. It supports surface pressure loads. What, where do you need surface pressure? If you're uh, working in tribology, for example, uh, where you may be looking at cracks in the bearing surfaces uh, with lubricants. So uh, the lubricants would uh, seep into the crack and then they would start applying pressure inside the crack that are that that and that's going to cause even further crack propagation and support for tabular pressure loads as a function of time and and also pcg and sparse solvers we'll talk about these so again the new crack surface pressure load um, that is now enabled in the new version and um, uh, for example, here we are looking at an edge crack panel subject to a thermal load. This is the thermal load contribution. Now, um, what that means is, you know, um, uh, we, we are also um, uh, enabling temperature loads like thermal stress loads. Uh, how does thermal stress affect uh, the crack propagation? That's what we are looking at here. And also uh, surface pressure. Uh, how does having surface pressure inside the crack, meaning that uh, acting on the crack surfaces, how does that affect 
the crack growth. And this is an um, verification case. As you see here, we have good uh, correlation with experimental results. And for really complicated cases, ANSYS now um, with cracks, uh, it, you can run it as distributed solution. Um, so distributed solution uh, is going to, uh, you know, make these runs a lot faster. Uh, and and also multi-step load and tabular loading, you can actually input, say, your pressure forces um, as a function of time on the crack faces. So now with the new version, this is all enabled. And yeah, uh, distributed. Uh, uh, here is on the horizontal axis, we are looking at number of cores. We have four and we have 16 cores. And the solver rating is uh, on the vertical axis here. So um, distributed answers uh, can be used with fracture mechanics problems. And you you will be able to uh, you will be able to uh, run your problems a lot faster this way. So uh, this is um, this is kind of um, the end of our presentation here. Again, if you'd like to get more insight as to how to do these models and how to make use of fracture mechanics capability in ANSYS. You may want to uh, think about signing up for our fracture mechanics class where we do have workshops. We go more into theory. We go more into ANSYS and how to implement this. Um, so, and also, uh, if, you, if you like, you can also look at the documentation. There's actually, in ANSYS help, there's a fracture analysis guide. And if you look at it uh, in the fracture analysis guide, there's a lot of example problems there under fracture analysis guide. And um, so we are Ozen Engineering. We are the channel partner out on the West Coast. Uh, it's our uh, address here. We're in Sunnyvale, California. You can send us an email to info at ozeninc.com or visit our website, www.ozeninc.com. So uh, I'm going to stop here. I actually went uh, about seven minutes over time here. Um, and I'll try to answer questions. Um, so can smart crack growth be used to model two cracks in a, in a plate? Most examples found through help uh, only show one crack front. Um, um, so, as you have seen, it's smart. If, if we cannot do it in smart uh, crack growth, we can do it in XFAM. Uh, you have seen one animation where there are multiple cracks using that. Uh, would it be another question? Would it be possible to get the slides, the recording of the seminar later on? The answer is yes. If you go to our website, um, ozoninc.com, uh, these um, all these seminars can be found um, on on our website. Um, all of these are on our website. Um, uh, Oh, uh, if you go to resources, there's a webinar library, resources webinar library. Uh, that's where you can uh, find all our, um, if you scroll down, it's kind of, um, you have under structures, uh, for example, we have linear, nonlinear dynamics. Under fluids, we have uh, our previous webinars on electromagnetics. We have other webinars on EBU. So uh, give us about a week. We are going to put it up uh, on this website here. Um, OK. So on the fracture parameters in answer slide, which parameter would you use for anisotropic plasticity 
for anisotropic plasticity, I would definitely use VCCT, the uh, energy method, G. Uh, uh, that's what I would use. Um, how would I enter temperature-dependent parastole parameters into ANSYS? Uh, that's a good question. How would you enter temperature-dependent parastole parameters into ANSYS? Uh, so if, if we go to, let's go to our uh, site over here. So as you see, um, material constant C and material constant M is what's required for parastole. And when you click on these, in the upper right-hand corner here, there's a table where it says temperature. Then you would start entering your temperatures. You say, this is at 20 degrees. And then you would enter at 50 degrees, I have 1 e to the minus uh, uh, 12, for example. So, so on, so far. You would just fill in this table here, and then in the meantime, ANSYS is going to update the a plot over here so that you can um, uh, see that. Um, how to subscribe to practical workshop? Will it be free or paid? Well, our, uh, you know, we are a for-profit corporation. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, our classes are $600 per day. So if you would like to sign up for our classes, you can go to training and events. And um, excuse me, you can sign up for uh, our classes there. There's a registration page. Uh, what else? Um, uh, is it possible to define surface roughness in ANSYS? Uh, good question. Uh, the answer is yes, you can. Um, well, uh, I'll take it back. I mean, uh, it depends on how we are, uh, if we are talking surface roughness with respect to contacts, contact formulations, then it is possible. But if we are talking about surface roughness with respect to um, uh, pre-cracks or existing cracks, so what I would do is I would actually um, uh, put in uh, a crack, surface crack. So, uh, especially with parts where you're machining the surfaces, that machining process can leave surface cracks on the surfaces. That uh, they may be tiny, and uh, but you can treat treat each one of those as a crack, and you can put multiple cracks over there. So, and that's that's really a manufacturing uh, issue. And it can be addressed in answers by putting multiple cracks along the machining direction. Um, okay. Uh, is it possible to do um, crack growth in porous rock? Okay, good question. Uh, that's definitely an anisotropic material, and as long as we can treat uh, porous rock as an anisotropic or orthotropic material, then it would be possible to do that. Internal cracks, yes, we can model internal cracks, and, uh, and as, uh, internal cracks, it, see, surface cracks usually happen uh, either due to manufacturing or due to fatigue. Internal cracks happen when you're working with bearings. Uh, in the bearing industry, under heavy loads, uh, it starts creating internal cracks. And uh, I used to work in the bearing industry many years ago, and that's why we used to deal with internal cracks. So in answers, yes, it is possible to put an internal crack and look at it, it's, uh, it's crack propagation. That's actually my thesis work back from ages ago. Have to subscribe to practical workshop. Oh, we did that already. Uh, yeah. Do you find a stress intensity factor method helpful to determine whether you have a limited life part? 
In other words, if below the threshold of k sub i should be high cycle or in infinite life. So, um, yeah, uh, that's another good question. So, when you do a ANSYS simulation and you find out uh, what the uh, what the stress intensity factor is, if the stress intensity factor is less than the threshold value that uh, of stress intensity factor, then that means that crack is not going to propagate. And um, yeah, and are there? Uh, if you look at uh, planes, airplanes, in airplane wings, there are actually a lot of surface cracks. And uh, the pilot's supposed to walk around the plane and take a visual look at those cracks. And some of these cracks, are they don't propagate um, when they are below a uh, certain uh, value. Is it hard to find fracture parameters needed? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, depends on the material. If it's an exotic material, it is difficult. Uh, you may want to look at um, if it uh, into mill military handbooks. Um, there's a lot of that available. Uh, and I also used to work in aerospace many years ago. Some of the uh, fracture testing that we did uh, in our test labs uh, at that company, we never ever would give that out because it cost the company a lot of money. So some of some of the materials you may not be uh, able to find it. Uh, plasticity around crack tip can involve a certain temperature increase. Is supported by ANSYS. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand that question, but yeah, plasticity around crack tip. Um, um, so I, I guess the question is, you know, uh, uh, ANSYS, uh, in other words, uh, as, uh, as there is plastic deformation, that can generate heat as well due to shearing effects. Um, so in ANSYS, you can actually write a, a script, uh, but you have to relate uh, the amount of plastic deformation. Maybe you have to take the plastic component of strain and relate that to temperature rise. And yes, it is doable, but it's doable by uh, writing scripts. So, okay, so I may have missed uh, some of these questions, but if you still have questions, you know, please feel free to send an email to info at elzoninc.com. I'll stop here. Thank you for attending our webinar. I'm going to stop